this is a uh, will be in a version of a talk I gave at CMU, which uh, didn't get me kicked out of the institute, so we we'll tried. Uh, I should throw in a couple of other things of background just to put things in some context, and will impact the the way I talk about things. Uh, besides uh, being at Penn for 15 years and then retiring to a, a lesser school like CMU, <laughs> we won't comment on that. Um, I served a year and a half as chief technologist for our Federal Communications Commission, where I was chief technologist as a person who advises the, the five-member commission on technical issues. So it was a rare opportunity to operate in the communication space at fairly high levels of policy making. Uh, and also from that position you end up advising uh, and doing the same thing with people on the Hill, the Congress and other agencies of the federal government, including Department of Justice. So it gave a, a quite nice perspective on things. The, the other thing is that I, I have been bouncing in and out of the networking business since its inception and I'll, some of that will be weaved into the talk. Okay, I, I always like to sort of uh, point out, I dedicate this talk to John Postel, which was my second PhD student. I was at the University of California at Irvine after leaving industry. I worked for Bell Labs and Rand Corporation in scientific data systems. And I got a call from UCLA, Jerry Estrin, saying he had a bright student up there who was interested in networking, but there was nobody at UCLA who was really interested in the nuts and bolts of networking, which is part of the reason my comments about uh, the announcement of UCLA's leadership. <clears throat> and um, so I, I worked with John. Uh, somehow I remember him looking the same when he was a student as when he was 50 <laughs> or 60. Uh, it was an interesting group of people. Many of them were, Ben Cerf was a student, Steve Crocker, uh, a bunch of others who went on to become, in some ways, the father of the Internet. And so I, in that sense, I consider myself a, a grandfather uh, of it. Uh, I cannot remember for the life of me whether Vint wore a vest as a student. I wish I could. For those of you who know Vint, it's painted on. It's sort of off welded <laughs> on. I also had an opportunity... That's interesting. What the hell that means? Uh, compatibility is a marvelous thing. I also had an opportunity at an early stage to uh, work at Rand with Paul Barron, who is probably, along with Don Davies, uh, the, I'm going to put big quotes around, the inventor of packet switching. It's always debatable whether anything gets invented in this field. And the notion of packetized stuff had been around for a while, but never in the way that either one of these two thought about it. Um, Paul was interested in actually the building of a survivable communication system and published a very large tomb that's still on the RAND site's site that led in the direction of packet switching. It wasn't the ARPANET technology, but it was close to it. It was sort of a a pre -do. It's fun to read it, and the original notes are online, so it's, it's entertaining to do it. Um, Paul is, has been very instrumental in a lot of things in uh, communication since then, including uh, some early use of SPET spectrum in high-speed modems and, and several other businesses he started. He's quite a gentleman. Uh, A lot of this talk is going to be sort of the sociology, and you sort of have to talk a little bit about the history of, of what's gone on in this space in order to appreciate where we are now and how we got there. Uh, I was a faculty member at Irvine, as I said, and the, the group of kids at UCLA. We got an interesting contract with, uh, with DARPA at that point at Irvine to do, to do an interesting piece of research, which I still think would be interesting, and so does Bob Kahn, who was the math program manager at that point. But what it really got us was network access. At that point, there was a very small set of schools that were on the experimental ARPANET with um, a couple of companies, and it was a defense network, and in order to uh, be on it, you had to have some research connection with DARPA. 
uh, we got that. Actually, the contract was an interesting one. It was to try to understand how to um, defeat flow analysis of packets. You're sitting watching the flow, looking at the headers and seeing who talks to who. It's a very valuable piece of intelligence in general. Uh, it's why wiretap is and, and uh, pen registers are so interesting, actually pen registers. Uh, what we did was keep changing the names and so all you saw were a random collection of names and you passed you know, the whole protocol to guarantee that you wouldn't get out of phase. Uh, we never did build it, but it got us the, uh, the connection. And it, it gave us a bunch of, uh, of targets for graduate students who at that point were working on what became an early distributed computer system, probably, I'd argue, probably the first that had ever really been built as opposed to paper design. But some of the students here did interesting things besides their the research on the distributed system because they were exposed to this technology in an early stage. One of them was Paul Marcopetras, who went on to develop the domain name system. Uh, Steve Crocker, I'm sorry, Dave Crocker, the brother of Steve Crocker, who went on to define the, the, the mail protocol, A22. So this immersion into that culture has some interesting impacts on the direction. The reason I spend a little bit of time here is that it also sets the scene for what was the sort of social interactions at that point between people on the net. Everybody was friends. You could sit in a room not much bigger than this and have a meeting of everybody working on the on the net at that point. And so there was very little attention paid to worrying about whether anybody was going to do anything bad. After all, it was hard enough in practice to do anything. And this was a real adventure. When you got a packet to actually go, you sort of cheered and it was a, a red letter day. Yeah, more or less worrying about things. So. All the stuff that was developed was developed in a spirit of collegial collab collaboration with no intention to make it uh, secure, or even lay the basis for later on securing it. And that, that's had a severe impact on how we got to where we are today, which is not a good way. So there was, the other thing was the rationale for what the network was going to be used for it was sort of funny if you read it in hindsight. Uh, Larry Roberts and I guess Bob wrote a, a document on it. What they, at that, the era of this, computers were scarce. PP11s were scarce. Uh, and not every school had it. And I guess 10s were just beginning to appear. And these were supercomputers of their day. So there was a strong feeling that the main use of the network was going to be to allow us to gain access to, to more powerful computers that weren't available on our site and may not have been available because they were expensive computers, especially in the academic world at that time, and some notion of file sharing, uh, which was a very primitive notion. You know, I want to read your paper. It's so easy to mail it to you, so I'd like to be able to FTP it across. So the, the fundamental notion of, of uh, application protocols here was a telnet to get to that other machine and an FTP to move files around. It became pretty clear that, that early on that people wanted to talk to people because, in fact, DARPA had a lot of contacts which spread across universities and there was a lot of collaboration in trying to make this thing work. So people started futzing around with, with leaving files with funny names on them. So if I wanted to send a mail to Ted, uh, I'd probably define a file called Ted Nelson on his computer in some shared space and I'd move over that file with that name and Ted periodically would go look and see if there's anything there. And it was just a text thing and if you wanted to put it back to me, you had to sort of remember who I was and where I could be found. Uh, obviously that got pretty tiring quite rapidly and so that's when Dave Crockett defined the, the A22 mail protocol, simple versions of it, to be able to get a more reasonable way of doing it. And a guy named John Vital created the first user agent, something called MSG, which is still one of the more interesting user agents around if it still runs. 
the PDP-11 was a character at a time environment, and this, this system took advantage of that. And it was quite pleasant. And it outlasted a, an awful lot of the more elegant mail systems. Simplicity in email is always welcome. But email also forced the definition now of what you meant by a person at a site. And so the whole, that tied in with the rapid, soon to be rapid growth of it led us to our current naming system, which has a lot of problems. No, no, it's, it's okay. The, um, which year you're talking about? Fun? Which year? When? Oh, this was uh, order 70, 60s, 70s, in the early 70s. I think the PDP 11 was announced in 70. Yeah, well, we, the 11s were around. I mean, the 10s were probably later in the, the thing. Well, but six, was, 6 came before 10, and that was the same architecture. Yeah, we had, um, that's right. We had, um, in our research project, we, we actually looked at 11s, but memories on 11s were, were quite expensive and very hard to, to get to work correctly in the early days, and the machines were expensive. So we picked another machine made by Lockheed because they had allegedly were in the memory business and built this high availability and distributed environment. Nice thing about it is we never had to fake a failure. The memories failed about every 10 minutes. <laughs> Some of the work done on the early networks, by the way, was very innovative. Uh, there was a nice uh, silver futures market going among some of the leaders of the Internet. <clears throat> uh, interesting. Uh, and, and there were a lot of problems, and those problems were somewhat interesting because they, we still get them occasionally now. Um, it was very hard to debug this bloody thing because if you were sitting with a protocol where it might fail one in 100,000 times. And then if you have 10 machines, or one in, say, um, yeah, say 100,000. If you have 10 machines, it may take you weeks before you get enough tries of that use of that protocol before it to break. Now, that was fine when there was a small number of machines. It's how it broke at all. Sometimes it didn't break. But as the increase, as it increased, suddenly you found errors in the protocols that were fundamental errors. And in fact, there's a whole uh, story, which I won't tell, bore you with, on a f very serious problem, which caused the whole net to lock up. This protocol, protocol design problem. Uh, there were very primitive tools to do any verification of protocols. There's still a lot of relatively primitive tools. In fact, John Postel's thesis was the first one in, in protocol verification something he was never interested in pursuing, so others did. Um, let's just walk through a couple of, of these steps. There was a transition uh, made when uh, a number of people, and again, it's very hard to credit who did what, but certainly Bent and Bob uh, and Bob Kahn were, were somehow key to this, the development of TCP IP, development of an internet protocol, which would allow you to tie together in principle, uh, uh, in non-homogeneous networks and be able to pass packets across those <coughs> um, networks. Uh, th there was an interesting problem there, how to go from the old network control protocol, NCP, into TCP, um, IP, which required completely different software. That was done in one day. The net was quietly turned off and then turned back on again, and everybody came up in TCP uh, protocol, and mostly it worked, and I still have a button that said, I survived the transition day. You can't do that anymore. There's no way you can transition the net in any viable way. There are too many machines that you don't have control over, and the thought of stopping the net for an hour while you quietly switched everything is, is sort of a meaningless concept now. It's gotten too big to experiment with in some real sense and too big to do massive changes. And you're seeing that in the problems with, with transitioning to things like uh, new versions of, of IP, so-called IP for V6. Was the last time they took it down for flag day for IP4? Uh, well, it was some version of IP, I forget which one. There wasn't a need for a slash 
uh, for slash cut with with the transitions up to four. Six, though, has some problems because of the addressing. What does slash cut mean? That means you stop everything and you go. It comes from an old telephone term. What you did in the telephone is you you had all your wires come in the central office. When you wanted to put in a new switch, you could do it two ways. You could take some lines and move them, take some other lines and move them. Or you could take all your lines and recable and put a parallel cable over to the new system, right? And then literally you turned on the new system and you went over to the old bundle of wires and you took an axe and you cut it, right? And you disconnected it that way. Right? And now you did a slash cut. That's how it actually that turned out. And it be plugged in one by one to see which No, I mean, well, friend, you just, you know, God we trust. Uh, <laughs> There's some good stories on what happened after slash cuts, uh, but I won't, I won't go into that. This one happened to be fairly quiet. Next thing that happened that had an interesting impact is an activity, and here you get into a lot of just big, noisy arguments of, of what a particular activity did and how important it was in the evolution of the Internet. I think what you, you have to do is sort of look and see how things evolved in practice and, and forget about credit handling. Uh, I, I like to look at it as just a historic set of events and then let people decide someday you know, how seminal those events were. A bunch of us um, noticed that there was this small group of people having a lot of fun. There were five universities and a bunch of companies and they were able to do interesting experiments on the then ARPANET, the NCP-based network. And uh, that was no fun. The other thing we noticed is this was during the era of the explosion in computer science in academia. And what we were finding out more and more was that the computer science field was turning into a bunch of subcritical clusters of people. Every school had one. But in, that, in most of the schools, you had one person in operating systems, one person in this field. And you know, most of computer science, as many sciences, doesn't operate very well with one person. You want groups of people that can at least vibrate together for a while. And the field was beginning to get, to get into trouble because of that. So we went to the NSF and with a proposal that says, why don't you let us to create a network which will tie together a science, computer science? Um, and they came back with a very interesting, uh, after, re after declining it once, then we resubmitted it, um, they came back with a very interesting approach which had a lot of impact on things um, and I think it's worth talking a little bit about. They said, okay, we'll do it. We'll give you the funding to do it. But we insist that after three years, we will no longer give you funding. Okay? So you'll have to turn into a self-sufficient organization within three years. And this sort of sidebar conversation was, look, the only way you're going to ever decide whether the community really likes this thing is to make them pay for it, one way or the other. Not much, but... You know, for most departments, I think the maximum we charged the a department was $1,000 a year. $1,000 may mean that one less graduate student took a trip or one fac less faculty had a little bit of money they could use. So it was a good technique. Was the capabilities of this network important enough for somebody to sacrifice a small but significant part of most departments' free money? A um, thousand was a long, a lot of money in the 60s, uh, especially for, for a, a relatively low research budget. We created uh, uh, several networks internally and rapidly grew to about 450 uh, departments in the United States. But two other things happened that set the direction of the net, I think, in interesting ways. One is uh, people came to us from the UK and others and said, hey, we'd like to do the same thing. We'd like, we'd like to create networks like that in our own turf. I think we had Finland, Japan, I think Canada certainly, 
though we we always have this problem with Canada deciding whether it's a foreign country or not, uh, which causes us to get the Canadians to get really unhappy when I say that. Um, <laughs> And we made a decision then that this was a rational thing to do for the science. But we also said one other thing, that we weren't going to deal with individuals or corporate individuals within those states. We wanted one person to deal with, one group to deal with. So we essentially forced the, the one way or the other, the evolution of, of equivalent academic computer science networks within these countries. If somebody else said, hey, I want in, we'd say, well, go talk to your friendly guy who who's, was there first. Uh, that, I think, was the right way to do because it forced countries to at least talk to each other and decide who was going to represent them. Sometimes this was not a pleasant thing, and we refused to get in the middle of it. Otherwise, we'd probably have been guillotined several times. Um, the other thing we had is is money problem. $1,000 times 450 institutions doesn't get you enough money to run a network. And so we said, ah, fine. Let's expand the charter a little bit to allow research laboratories of corporations to come in. Now, one could ask, why would they want in? They had, a, had found a very interesting problem on their hands. This is a time when computer science graduates were in fierce demand. They were, when they went to interview people, they found that People ask them, do you have email? Do you have a network connection? Can I continue to talk to my friends? The answer was no. Yeah, next company. And so the, they were very happy to come, and we just charged a small mock-up, $25,000. Yeah, seemed reasonable, and they paid. And so the, the industrial research labs ended up supporting the academic world, which was fine as far as we were concerned. Then, <laughs> then predictably, the uh, corporation said, hey, by the way, can we use this thing to help uh, our salespeople in the universities? What happens, for instance, if a, a faculty sends us a note asking about one of our products? Uh, you know, we said we'd be non-commercial, but after all, this is helping research. And so we, we uh, sort of bent the rules a little bit and said, if it's in support of the academic research, fine. Well, that was opening up, to put it mildly, a, a, a huge chasm, and everybody leaped in. And that was fine for us. We didn't care. The other observation we did here is we refused to let the companies count five research lives they had as one. Each one had to have its own membership, domestically and abroad, which raked in more money. But um, this forced an issue, both of these forced an issue on a policy between uh, DARPA and the rest of the world. And Bob, Bob, who was at that point in DARPA, and a bunch of us came to the agreement that we would have a zero-sum game, which set the whole path of peering points which are essentially do roughly the same thing. We weren't going to sit there counting packets, and we weren't going to sit there writing checks to each other. That we would go on the assumption that the traffic in both directions were equal, therefore nobody owed anybody anything, which, which I think was the very much correct move. Whether these things were intentional and we sat back and said, ah, we are going to set future direction, I could claim it, but it would be nonsense. These were sort of short-term things that, in general, were fairly well done. Okay, and then uh, I don't want to spend too much historical time, but um, it's worth popping through several other steps. Uh, in the early days, not all the networks with TCP were TCP IP networks. Some of them were X25 tunneled IP packets through them. The NSF, um, in response to a very interesting problem, Computer science departments certainly found themselves the, the uh, provider of Internet services to all, the, all their colleagues in the university who also wanted to get on the net. And that, this got a little bit out of hand, both logistically for the computer science departments and, and for, for CSNet and for NSF. So pretty rapidly, a paper was written for um, 
science magazine called ScienceNet, which turned out to be a trademark term, so it, we changed it to NSFNet after we were notified that we couldn't use that name. And this was an, this was an intent to, to make available to the entire academic community the capabilities which had shown themselves to be profitable in CSNet. Notice it was the entire academic community, not the NSF science community. That was a conscious effort also, which I think did a lot. That rapidly evolved because this network had to be self-sufficient itself to one that really was open to the commercial traffic. And then rapidly it, it regionalized in the US. Um, people supplying backbone services decided to work together and you got Surinet and Isonet and, and endless networks, which were which helped the universities in their geographic area, and a lot of them went commercial, went from nonprofit to for profit, and that was the evolution of the the, the backbone carriers, PS, PSI, uh, UUNet went came out of this a whole bunch of things, and eventually where we are now. Now <coughs> some of these things, if you looked in hindsight, you would have done differently, but um, where we are now is not bad, although there are some problems. I talked about it being the old boys. Um, you know, as things evolved uh, rapidly, computers got cheaper and suddenly nobody wanted to share computers anymore. And everybody had a PDP-11, everybody had a, damn near everybody had a 10, and when the PCs hit, everybody had PCs. So the idea of sharing resources it took a long time to reestablish itself, and it really hasn't been. I mean, grids are sort of in that direction, but uh, I don't think those have panned out quite as well as people wish they would or say they have. But people wanted to communicate very much between themselves, and that's, I think, still one of the main drivers of the net. <coughs> you know, we, we all somehow um, watched the evolution of the web as being the thing that made the internet the thing the thing it is today. But I would argue that what probably made it more of that was email. I think if you took off for some reason uh, web access, you'd lose a lot of people, but you'd still, it would still be a very important vehicle. If you took off email, nobody would be left. And I think that's important from future directions. People want to talk to people, they want to communicate. And we've been very reticent in actually following that path. While we've talked for years about being able to do a meeting like this in virtual space, we, we haven't done it. Uh, the, the few things we've done have been interesting. I shamed the IAB into actually going, providing video access to their meetings. I don't know whether they still do. You know, even the community itself, while they talked about it, never used it. What is the IAB? The Internet uh, Activities Board. It's the controlling board for the IETF, which is the Internet Standards Group. There was a big complaint about the fact that they m met so often in different cities, and their argument, besides it, it's nice to see different cities, was that that way pe more people had access to be able to sit around in the meetings. And I said, you know, what the hell ever happened to video conferencing and all that stuff? And it's still... Outside of the, uh, in the serious world, it's still, I think, a, a somewhat neglected thing in the academic world. Uh, and I think that's, there's a great future in that, but we have to do it right. And that is not easy. I can talk about that later. Uh, if you look at the implications of what happened as time went on, I, I tend to look at it this way. In the old days, I draw a picture of the net, and I have the total net. I have a little set of clouds, and computers hooked to that cloud. And the net was ways of hooking computers together. If you drew that now, you'd see a big cloud and little dots scattered around it, which are, I guess, computers. The, nobody cares about computers anymore. The, the notion of the net is not to connect to computers. It's, it's to do something else. It's to have the connectivity of information, connectivity of people dealing with other people, not just to connect computers together. 
fact, hardly anybody thinks of it that way. But a lot of our designs were, were not, um, haven't gone that way in the sense of when you get down to sort of the guts of network architecture and computer architecture, there's some bad con discontinuities all over the place. The computers are still the engines. We have to be able to use them in order to drive these other applications that we really want. And I, I don't, nobody computes anymore. In, in the way I learned to compute, you know, you put in some numbers and out came a pile of numbers. Uh, when's the last time I wrote an, an algorithmic program that actually did that? Uh, long, long time ago. In fact, I'm not sure I remember how to program anymore. Um, what's happening now is we're under... <laughs> <laughs> that's another thing that's happening, but I'll get to that in a few minutes. We're getting into a new era now, and the results of that, this transition are going to be fairly wild. Someplace in this mess of slides, I have one that says, if you thought the last 25 years was wild, wait for the next 10. Because several things are happening sort of simultaneously in the technology space. One is we can go to much, much higher speeds than we've ever been able to before. Now, gigabit networks, which Eight years ago, we did gigabit test beds, are now slow walking. 10 gigs, 20, 40 gigs are relatively easy to supply. Unfortunately, when you hook a 40 gig network into most computers, computer complexes, it's roughly akin to hooking a fire hose into a garden hose. It's a bad impedance mismatch. And that, that was true even in the days of gigabit. If you looked at plugging a gigabit link into a, even a relatively high-performance processing unit, uh, you notice that by the time you get to the application, if you can get 50 uh, megabits of traffic, you can consider yourself a big win. You can, you can fake more than that if you go down at the very bottom and you throw the data away, but that's cheating. The the end-to-end -end performance is pretty bad. A lot of this is because we never built architect computer architectures for networks. What we did was graft those on to the end of a I/O architecture was was built to do on-demand movement of data from tapes, from disks, things like that, and occasionally did some asynchronous stuff with teletypes and and various things like that. But most of it was highly synchronous. You knew what you were going to get, and you put made space for it, and you brought it in, and you played those games. Networks have never been that. You, know, you suddenly get hit with, uh, with a couple of gigabytes in your face, and we, neither the I.O. architecture, the memory architecture, or anything else is prepared for that. When you scale it up to, say, 50 or 60 gigs, forget it. Now, you might argue, well, who needs 50 or 60 gigs in my PC? But now you go look at the other side of the house of what's happening in the process architecture, and what we're seeing coming down the road are chips with multiple cores on them. <coughs> Inherently, large number of computer systems operating on this one chip in some fashion or other, as, as independent or, or synchronized computers, depends on how you use them. And speed's going up. And another thing beginning to happen to you that crossing that boundary from the chip to the outside world is getting harder and harder because of the speeds you have to go on. So first you have a tremendous amount of computing power in there that you want to feed. Otherwise, you know, sort of, why do it? And the history of computing tends to be that you, if you have computing power, you want to use it. If nothing else, you can always run an AI program on it. That will consume all the others. <laughs> and, so, and so the this interface problem combined with the networks strongly suggests that we're going to have to relook at a lot of things. Um, how we, what it means to run an optical network. Do we really want a packets? Do we really want a protocol that was, protocol family that was designed for high error rate, slow speed communication? If you look at TCP IP, largely it's designed for a, a, a relatively high error rate system has a lot of stuff in it dealing with errors, a lot of stuff dealing where the, the latency 
bandwidth products just break you very badly. Um, and there's a huge amount of overhead in an environment where why bother? So that I think there's going to be a whole change of attitude in, in computers that are designed to hook into networks, networks which are lean and mean, and are going to force computer operating systems to become lean and mean too. Because again, no matter how I try, if I have a Windows environment there and I try to pour enough bits at it, guess what happens? Even if I can get it through the, the hardware, the software system will collapse out <coughs> from under me. At least it will meter me down to nothing. So it's a, it, there's a golden opportunity that will probably happen in a couple of years as these things start hitting the street. We're already capable of giving you the 40, 50, 60 gig. That's no problem. And the multiple core machines are already beginning to come off. And by, probably by the end of the decade, we'll be up to 10 to 20 cores per chip. That's a lot of computing power. So we, we have to marry these together. And we probably have to throw away the protocols we have because they don't work anymore. They will not work correctly anymore. Changes like that are hard. People don't like to make changes with a vengeance. The network is also sort of changing a lot of things in our economy, and this being one of them. By the way, every time you make a change, like a dramatic change like that, some companies don't make it. Some do. Now they, they change them to the mini com microcomputer. Um, I was commenting on uh, down in, uh, where am I? <laughs> yeah, in London. <laughs> uh, be okay. Uh, that if I gave a talk 15 years ago and I told you that in 2004 nobody would know what Digital Equipment Corporation was, you would have called the local you know, booby hatch. Uh, if I told you IBM would no longer be a real force in, in computers, you would have said nonsense. I said that in my 1977 book. Good. Okay. But most people would have said nonsense, which they probably said that. Uh, and yet, they failed to make that transition. Here, the transition could take out a lot of companies. You know, there's a big company up in the northwest of the United States which may not make that transition. They may. They may be smart enough, but they may not be. IBM was smart. Uh, Ken was smart at digital, right? but he just saw it in a different way. So it's, it's an opportune time for dramatic changes in the economy. Uh, the reaction of most companies to dramatic change is to say, whoa, let's slow this down to a crawl, please. Uh, we don't like that. If you look at the communication field in general, something I've been immersed in, uh, you see that in spades. The Internet has produced a whole set of very disturbing um, uh, challenges to establish buggy whip industries, like the telephone industry. The ability to carry voice over uh, the internet, which is relatively simple, uh, really challenges a, a very large established uh, industry called the telephone industry. And it challenges it where it hurts, because that I, I can do it over the net for peanuts while the infrastructure in the <coughs> telephone industry is big, ponderous, and very expensive to replace. Even the maintenance itself will bankrupt you on that stuff. So there's, there's a, a problem here which is going to be sort of bloody. It's not going to be pleasant. You also, in, at least now in the U.S. context, uh, I always have to say that I'm you know, a U.S. person and I, don't, I know some of the rest of the world but not much of it. Uh, we have two alternative ways into the house. We have three, but I'm not a big believer in power line data. I think it causes noise problems are severe, and we get a lot of lightning storms. And I've yet to, every time I ask the guys who do the power line data, what happens when you get a lightning stroke on the line, they say, we don't know. It worries me. <laughs> I know what happens to telephone equipment, it fries. And I assume it will happen to that stuff too. Um, but so let me focus on the two viable ones here. These two in the future, we're going to offer roughly the same set of services. Okay. The telephone company offers voice and data. 
the cable operator in the U.S. at least is offering video and telephone and data. Data isn't all the cat's meow, but there's new protocols coming out that will make it much better. Can I ask a naive question? Sure. sure. Talking about data and telephone, currently, what are the internet backbones? Are these physically separate cables from telephone cables? Because the internet backbone uses the, the same data facilities that are used by the telephone company, but uh, they don't go over... I, most of them don't use IP now. I mean, it's the same physical uh, carrier, digital carrier systems, but usually with different protocols. So it can it could be the physically same cable. Yeah, yeah, okay. or optical cable. But isn't the phone company renting those cables? They're renting those cables. Long, well, some of them are owned by the phone company. So, so they so they have a revenue stream that won't be lost by the replacement of. of, of but the cost stream, unfortunately, and the revenue stream comes from the retail service, not the rent on. I mean, you can rent fiber cheap now, and that's probably not going to change very much. So majority of rent revenue comes from that little thing that has the phone on it, and that's been going down. These two, telephone company has a lot more problems offering video. There they most likely would have to make a massive investment the cable industry is falling apart. They have to make a, a fairly massive investment in order to get the type of high quality delivery to the home. Both of them have to do fibers at home. Eventually, uh, this guy is fibered out closer to the home than this guy, but they all, both have massive investments. Now two things happen. People don't put massive investments in unless they can find an economic return. And that's a big, big problem for two reasons. If you know, my friendly telephone company decides we're going to put fiber in, and with that fiber we're going to offer video. Okay? The only way we can offer real video is going to be to put fiber to the home, although there are some alternatives. I don't think they'll play very well. If you look at the economics of that in the U.S., in order to profitably put in the fiber, you're going to have to capture 75 to 80 percent of the customers of the cable system, which, you know, in real terms is impossible. You can't transition that many people, especially when the services are, for practical purposes, equivalent to the average person. So there's a big problem there of how you're going to get your customers. The second big problem is, suppose I deliver, I don't know, take a choice, a gig to the home, yeah, that sounds good. And the Japanese do it, and a number of places do it. What is the what is the person going to do with it? What is he willing to, or she willing to pay for that gig? Right now, not my guess is nothing. I I have a three a three meg uh, DSL line coming into the house. Would I pay more for a, a gig DSL line? Eh, I may. Um, I like gadgets. But I doubt if most people would pay a penny more because the effect of what they see will not be substantially different. And so it's, it's that game again. What's the application that makes it viable, economically viable, to, to squeeze more money one way or the other out of the, out of the, the person, I hate the term consumer, out of the citizen who is connected to this or the person who is connected? Not clear. Now, in the past, we've always found that when you do it, something arises to use it, etc. But, you know, you're, you're talking about massive investments on a prayer, and that doesn't... So, what are, are people going to do with it? And I think that's something we've tended to neglect quite a bit. And it's something that people in the business don't have the biggest idea in the world of what to do with it. There's another embarrassing thing in the U.S. which also factors in this which is worth thinking about. I last looked at these numbers in 1995, so I can't attest they're the same now. But back then, if you looked at the percentage of household income that was used to pay for communication services in the broader sense of the term, okay, newspapers, radio, whatever the communication service at the time was, it remained constant. And 
when a new service came in and had to rob the old service. And so you have both what's the new service that I'm going to attempt to rob, right, and who do I rob it from? Where do I get more money out of, out of this pocket? If all I do is displace, fine, provided I displace your, my, my, other, my opponent's money, not my own money. That doesn't, that doesn't do me any good. Right. Not, not with the investment. So there's a whole bunch of problems that we have to face in the future uh, economically. There's also two others I'm just going to mention briefly. Um, everybody sort of thinks wireless is going to be the catch me out. Uh, in the U.S., it is very difficult to do anything in the wireless space. Uh, there's no available space in good wireless. Now, there are, tech, there are proposals. I, uh, Jerry Fallhaber, who was chief economist at the FCC when I was chief technologist, afterwards wrote a paper which has gotten good traction proposing an approach to freeing up spectrum. And it was a sort of result that causes a lot of my colleagues in the public interest groups to want to write a contract on me. And that's just the recognition that people who currently hold licenses for that spectrum own that spectrum. And all, all statements have said it's public spectrum, it's on, it just doesn't deal. Even our courts in the U.S. have said, no, sorry, you know, they have a right to that spectrum and you can't take it away even if they're not using it. So it's not, certainly not owned by the government in any real sense, maybe in some formal sense, but it's owned by the licensees. And so the way you get that out of their little grasp, because most of them don't use it, is to make it attractive for them to give it away to you, sell it. And that's essentially what we propose. One was a bunch of other things, which would create a vast um, set of available spectrum underneath the, the uh, spectrum that people are using for other things, using software radio, agile radios, to find unused spectrum and hop, hop around when spectrum gets, the owner wants to use that spectrum, fine, I'll find some other spectrum. And those radios are becoming available. In fact, you can buy one for $350. It's quite a nice little radio, handheld, very good. You need a, a ham license, but those don't take much anymore. So the technology is there. Public policy isn't there. That's going to be a long walk. Uh, our thought was if you can make an attractive industry to exercise their normal greed that they might buy in, and they may. The other thing in the U.S. context, by the way, it's important to look at things like the Wi-Fi spectrum, which um, is un unlicensed, which means exactly, according to the the rules that it's up to you to deal with interference. Now, in most of the spectrum, if somebody interferes with you, you go at, at them with a machete or at least a, a formal complaint. Wi-Fi, you can't. It's up to you to deal with it. And you can't argue, shut him up, he's interfering with me, which makes it very, uh, very flaky in some environments. People are already putting one of your amplifiers on the body thing. It's illegal but there's no effective enforcement mechanism there. And you can, you can radiate anything you want in that spectrum, given you obey the rules. So it's not a good, in my point of view, it's not something that I would care, for instance, to count on for voice communication, not for real voice communication. Let me see. Uh, yeah, uh, let me do politics 101. Uh, rapidly. <laughs> and again, U.S. Okay. I think one of the most difficult, there are several difficult issues we have to deal with in, in the future. Besides technical issues I talked about, some of these are, and I'll, I'll sort of do it in reverse. In my humble view, the network is falling apart, and I know some people disagree how much it's falling apart. But when when I know how I can bring the, the domain name system to its knees without even trying. Uh, we're in bad shape. And so far, nobody's done it. But the root servers can be attacked and successfully attacked. And it's very hard to fix. Not impossible, but difficult to see how to fix it. You mean an individual crash is hard to fix or the, the, the general condition? The, the, to, 
ensure that the domain name system cannot be taken down effectively would require a lot of changes. It should be changed anyway, but the combination of ICANN and, and technology is not a healthy thing right now. So pr presumably the enemies of our country or our culture could in know how to do this and could any time yeah. down the Yeah. It's not trivial to find out, but it's, uh, I would argue, and maybe I'm over dramatizing it, that if any of my graduate students who are in the networking business couldn't figure out how to do it, I'd be PhD students. I'd really be a little bit worried about them. It may take them a couple months because they have to go search a little bit. But it's not that hard. Uh, privacy is a severe problem in the U.S. I'm not, I don't think the, the average citizen, once they wake up, uh, hopefully they'll wake up on November 2nd, but who knows, is going to be very fond of the fact that everything they send over the net could be observed, maybe being observed. Uh, the way business treats in the U.S. in private information there's a lot of things here. The combination of very poor security on hosts and on the net itself, the inability to stop uh, the attacks on, on PCs, the inability to, do, to come up with a scheme which would prevent machines from becoming outdated and therefore susceptible to attack, and, and then being able to attack is just not, uh, not easy. We had a grand challenge uh, thing in security. One of the key questions was, how, do, how would you do automatic updating of systems and still guarantee that that wouldn't be used as a vehicle for automatic destroying of the computer environment? You know, Microsoft is a good example. They want to automatically upgrade your computer. That's, that could cause some hysterical chaos as 100 million machines collapse. So there are real serious questions here, and that, that's a big problem. More serious in the long run is, is this guy. Can I just answer faster? Dave? Brian, can, they, can you give me your, can you call me back in a half hour? Oh. Okay. That's the guy who I was trying to get hold of. Um, Back here. The things like voice over IP, things like CLIA. Do people know what CLIA is? What? CLIA. I spelled C A L E R A? Something like that. CLIA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I keep forgetting the way the initials go together. CLIA is a, is a, a law which. Um, I'm trying to remember what the, all the letters stand for, but it doesn't make any difference. Which, one of the problems in the telephone business relative to law enforcement is that law enforcement is always considered wiretap to be a very powerful tool for law enforcement and now for national security. We'll have big debates over over that, but for a moment that, that's a, uh, something that's... Uh, strongly held by law enforcement. They need the legal right, and sometimes the legal right, to do wiretap on selected individuals in order to do their task. And uh, they also need flow information, which they don't even need a subpoena for. But the, let me look at just the wiretap. What's happened with our telephone system is it's gotten much more sophisticated. It's in the old days, when you wanted to wiretap a, a person's phone, you climbed the pole. You know, and a little FBI sit guy would sit up there freezing to death, and he'd listen. Well, that got, they got smarter than that. They put, so every central office has a set of, of wires to go back to the local field office, and given the proper piece of legal paper, it's connected to that line, and light comes on when the line comes up, and he sits in warm comfort with a tape recorder recording. Problem is that with all the services we offer, you're never quite sure where that person is. He, he may not be on his phone line, yet he's calling as if he was on his phone line. Uh, if he's on a cell phone, who the hell knows where, he's, where he is. So what, what the law enforcement got the Congress to do was demand that the telephone industry provide 
automated facilities for remote wiretap in this new environment. Uh, they, call, they said it would cost $500 million. I testified and said, I called the full Software Employment Act of 2003. It's, it's a, a major set of changes you have to make. But fine, for a moment, let's suppose that that makes sense. Along comes voice over IP. Should that be, should, after all, telephones are there. So clearly that should be part of the clear requirement. The FCC actually, under strong pressure for the FBI, um, sort of took a half a step and said, well, we'll insist on clear on voice over IP only for those calls which, trend, which connect into the phone system, so which cross the gateway. But that's, you know, that's procrastinating because the FBI immediately came back and said, what? <laughs> Considering that DSL goes over the same physical phone line, can they use that as a way to fudge it if it's computer to computer? Because DSL is a phone line. Well, right now they don't have to do computer to computer. No, that's what I'm saying. But if they wanted to, could they say that because it's DSL that is a phone line, therefore it does it No, no, that's on a different, it's on a different mental Okay. Uh, direction. Fine. If you do that, you're in real trouble Fine. from a regulatory policy. The only way I think to do this in practice is to put requirements on what's inside the computer system. Otherwise, otherwise there'll always be bypasses to it. The FCC sits there and say, with a mandate saying that they must pass rules in an environment they know nothing about. And there's a real fear that that's, the, I think, a realistic fear that that's the first step into the regulatory group in the United States getting interested in regulation in the net. The last thing I did when I was at the FCC was I was involved in the AOL Time Warner merger because we had to approve a license transfer, which you would think would be a trivial thing. But, you know, anything that you have to affirmatively say is okay means that you can put conditions up to kazoo on it. And the conditions that some people wanted would have would have essentially regulated the net. We managed to get to back off to only regulating, only demanding certain things about uh, open access on, on cable and some things about an internet uh, chat, internet, uh, whatever you call it. SMS. AIM, instant messaging. But now, once, once regulatory people get in there, it's a big mess. I think the answer to this one was will be no, it will, will not escape, because first of all, in the Washington scene, the lobbyists are very good, and most of the lobbyists come from the established communication companies who would like the net to go away, uh, aside from the, the computer side of the house who are not so effective on that. And I think eventually the argument is going to be one of of the old argument, oh, leave that. the old argument of the world, which is when you're up the hill and you have a congressman who has employees of the phone company in every one of their district, and where the phone company is a major employer, now you walk up to them and say, if you don't do something about it, all those jobs are going to be lost in your district, sir. And besides, here's some money for your campaign. It's a very effective thing. Meanwhile, you're, the reverse is, well, Cisco would like you not to do that. Where's Cisco? Out California? Screw them. Uh, network companies? Who knows where they are? Computer manufacturers? They're not in our district. And the, the, uh, the constituents hardly have a whisper. So there's some major problems there. That's just, by the way, a picture of Mike, Mike Armstrong. Uh, Mike Armstrong. Mike Powell. <laughs> Close to it. Yeah. He's an interesting guy. He's the current chairman of the FCC, the son of uh, Colin Powell, um, a military guy himself, uh, would have been a career military guy except he flipped the Jeep at the wrong time and was in the hospital for a year. Very smart guy. Um, but even smart guys are running in trouble managing the FCC. <laughs> uh, I... I hope I sort of weaved a funny little path here. I thought this would be a whole lot more fun than, than technical gibberish, which I could also give a talk on. Uh, and I think it's probably a good thing to do is spend a few minutes answering any questions. If I haven't generated at least a question or two, I've failed again. Anybody? What? Um, 
Are you mentioning that you think the only way of effective regulation um, is to actually control what goes on inside the computer? Um, I think seems, eventually. If I mean, if you have a, a content agnostic network and freely available access to crypto, it seems obvious that that's the way forward. Um, but and, and there was a lot of noise about Palladium and whatever acronym it became, and and SCUB and and, and the, the, the moves towards that. Um, do you think? I mean, the big question is whether they'll actually gain commercial acceptance. I think they'll gain commercial acceptance. Um, it's going to be a pardon me, commercial acceptance has two parts to it. I think the the uh, that family of approaches, the the uh, Lagrange architecture or NAMD's equivalent, and and a number of systems which will interface to that are very attractive to industry. And in fact, if I were doing it, I'd make it a business machine. I think it's time to split the products anyway. I, I, I've consulted with Intel for a long time on this and Microsoft also, which is strange to go to Microsoft having testified against them. Um, I think it will succeed. I think it will do, it's capable of doing many good things as well as a few bad things. And rights management is, is there. I, I take a very simple attitude towards rights management. It can be used to, in bad ways, and it can be used in good ways. They want to protect their music. I want to protect my privacy. Those mm -hmm. two both can use the same mechanism. I think we can pretty well assure with the current architecture that we have, and that's not what we'd like, that we can protect um, a lot of stuff against anything other than a physical attack. Physical attacks are going to be hard. They always have been, but the, most of the most of the compromises are not physical compromises. So I, I think there's a good chance of that. And I can almost see someday a requirement that if you want voice over IP, not necessarily that you put that particular piece of gear in, but that you put inside your device, whatever it is, the appropriate software necessary for remote notification of. of Activity. And, mm -hmm. So, I mean, do you, do you think it will be um, backdoored in a sort of clipper chip kind of way? Oh, I don't think it will be backdoor. It'll be very front door. Uh, yeah, I mean, you don't need backdoors with Windows. Then. No, no. Sure. <laughs> okay. um, I mean, the the picture you're you're painting is one that a lot of us are seeing in terms of a general lockdown of property. Um, you know. A, an attempt to control things using sort of old technological and old economic models. And then we've got the pushback from people like Larry Lessig and right. Mr. Kale and so on of trying to get more of a more of a public domain in here. And, and Larry's been pushing issues like around things like wireless of and spectrum of we don't need to own the spectrum. You can have an intelligent device that simply picks things off the spectrum and, and looking for more innovative technological solutions. Do you think, but he's not getting very far yeah, in the current right. political situation. Um, how much pushback do you think is going to be effective and, or versus how much juggernaut are you seeing well, let me, of a real lockdown? Yeah, let, me do two, let me address two things because they're a little different. Um, there's been several meetings on, on, uh, on the Commons issue on Spectrum. And, in fact, we addressed that in the paper that Jerry and I wrote, the trouble with commons is you still need rules. And it turns out before you've done those rules, end up generating either a court system to, to do it through litigation or regulatory authority. So you don't escape regulation. In fact, you get to rationally carry on anything like a commons. Uh, you need to do something we've never done before, which is type certify receivers. Yeah, which is not recommended. Also, we have to worry about it in practice how to do, how to certify transmitters of the software, which nobody knows yet. But you know, there are a lot of problems. The the better the thing I personally find is that, and the political pushback is almost impossible. Now, no self-respecting congressman is going to fight the National Association of broadcasters. And and, the, and Hollywood. It's just a lost leader if you ever saw one. Right? So arguing about commons is, is difficult. And also commons without a lot of control 
No, we had a commons, which was called CB Radio. It, it collapsed because it hit the tragedy of the commons with a vengeance. I think the way to do that is to is to structure a commons into a system that's more palatable to to the established players, and that's why this notion, uh, the model we took, was to fine. You want to own your your land? Be my guest. But we want the rules, which I think some Scandinavian countries have, that I can go across your property, provided I don't meaningfully interfere with you. I put the meaningfully on because saying I don't interfere has is nonsense in the in spectrum. You always interfere. So politically, that's happening more here physically too. Lots yeah. recently. And those, I want the same in spectrum. If you're not using your spectrum, I should be able to use it until you. If I interfere with you or you ask for, you're, you're about to use, in which case I'll move. So what opens up is a huge spectrum. It's an easement across the whole spectrum, right? with some small exceptions because of the GPS, you don't want this on the line, their frequencies, it doesn't work. But there are very few exceptions. And so now now you have a, a big commons, but you have it in, this, in a framework that's politically acceptable. Uh, in the... Uh, IP space, the intellectual property space, which I'm become, becoming sort of like Pam, I hate the term because it carries too much baggage. Uh, that's more of a problem. Uh, I'm far from convinced that um, that you can't have your cake and eat it. Now, a lot of the argument has to, has to do with with uh, fair use and stuff. And you know, some of the some of the uh, the digital rights management systems that are proposed can give you, I think, a rational fair use. And and Congress can can legislate what is rational fair use. I think you come up with something which would strike a nice balance there. Um, there are other ways. The record industry has their problem. But if you go go to Japan and look at what they do, and it's it's a very good model. One of the biggest business in Japan, and the reason that Sony mini discs are sold, and the only reason sold, they're sold, and why they were sold with 72 minutes on them, 74 minutes, while in the U.S. they were 60, is they used to copy rental CDs. What the record companies do, and Sony's a big player in this, is for about a month, they don't have the, the, a new CD in the rental shops. Then they have them in the rental shops. They're priced on the assumption that copies are going to be made. Happy day. When you price right, who cares? You've gotten, you've gotten the big hit of, I want it, I want it now, and you've gotten the, the ongoing sales, and everybody's happy. There's no attempt to do anything in Japan to block that because they found a business model that makes sense. If you go talk to RIAA, uh, something we also haven't taken advantage of, there's a lot of dissension in the record industry. The big the big labels control RAA. The small labels think they're bunkos, that they're just, you know, sort of shooting themselves in the foot left and right. And but we sort of ostracize the whole industry, as opposed to going and saying, hey, can we work together and come up with some rational thing and then push it through? Because you're part of that industry. I think there are cures for that, um, that are that fit within to push the current system in directions. Uh, and I think it's good to have people take extremes on both sides because that tends to, you know, to, to find a middle ground that you can walk. But the, the, a lot of the IP intellectual property people are bonkers. They also lie. The worst part of it. I, I sat in endless meetings with the FCC in the broadcast. The big player, the big warrior is Disney. They're panicked. Because they, their point of view is the first time we broadcast a, a a precious movie, Cinderella, on high definition digital broadcasting is the last time we ever sell a Disney, ever sell Cinderella, and their business who who are generational they re-release, right? you know, for so many months every generation, as long as they can convince the Congress to let the copyright keep extending, they're happy as little locks. Uh, but they're scared stiff for that one time, so they come in with marvelous things to cure the problem. And you look at them and you say, but the kid's going to break that in a week. Yeah. Ah, well, well, the FBI will get them. 
<laughs> One assumes, I used to assume the FDI had better things to do, but I'm beginning to think maybe that's a better thing for them to do than what they'd like to do. That's what I'm sorry. Um, a part of it, and that whole industry lies to the Congress and to the regulators. And there's no, there's no pushback or very ineffective pushback. You know, there's a couple of groups that, that do it. Larry goes down there occasionally, but you know, that's not the way lobbying works, as you know. It's, it's sort of constant hammering, and they're very good at that. And the opposition is very poor at it. I'd like to speak up here for what we're doing at the OII with trans copyright and not well-known doctrine. Uh, everyone knows about open source. The objective of open source is to make sure that the, that, uh, con that uh, program lump files of programs can be reused, and ideally, as in the GNU public license, that the changes chase the original, so you always get the changes. <clears throat> in the uh, Larry Lessig's family of Creative Commons licenses, the objective is that lump files can have very specific licenses for their reuse. Trans copyright is a different animal. It is a pre-permission for the reuse of fragmentary content from the net and to bring it in to recomposite content in new structures. And this has been ignored because it is, it is at right angles to the, to the current controversy. The current controversy is all about lump files and all about seeing those lump files in a fixed manner, whereas one of the principal benefits of um, uh, public domain content is that it can be reused in many ways without, that, that are beneficial that the initial uh, creator had no, uh, control, had, had no thought of. So trans copyright doctrine says this material is online. You may reuse it in a new context provided you don't distribute it. You only distribute a map of how to reuse it. For example, if it's movie shots, <clears throat> The, uh, you can distribute your own edit of that movie as an edit decision list. Now the, the customer or recipient downloads the content and possibly pays for it. So the objective here is not that everything shall be free because it, it's not a world in which everything will be free. It is a world in which owned and sold content can derive some of the reuse and rearrangement benefits that is currently denied to all copyrighted material. So we're working on this here at the OII, and I just met with Larry Lessig last week, and he has said he is going to endorse trans copyright, put up a Creative, copyright, trans, creative Commons trans copyright license, and furthermore scrutinize all the existing Creative, copyright, uh, creative Commons licenses to see which ones are compatible in order to, to uh, move this along. In the trans copyright model, would it be uh, obligatory or optional to make your own content available for um, other people to reuse in this way? It, it's entirely optional. So that like the GNU public license, the rights holder chooses to place things under trans copyright. The, <clears throat> the special benefit of that name is that you have an ordinary copyright symbol is preceded by trans. So you're not relinquishing any of your copyright, but saying, in addition, I give this permission for all online reuse. Since it is a permission doctrine, it is a license, requires no new legislation in any country, and <clears throat> essentially allows everyone to do this. What the, the missing link we have now, and I haven't had time to put up on the website, a cute piece of software that will take a list of content pieces from anywhere on the net, concatenate them, and give you a... Um, and give you... A, a, concatenate them on your local machine into a web page, which offers access to the original content context of each piece. So this is the, this is a missing link which which has been lost in the in the shouting about MP3s and all of the things the kids are, con are concerned about because scholars, authors, everybody wants to be able everybody wants to be able to reuse content and we don't have that right. Thank you for okay. Um, I was going to ask you a slightly uh, question more about the network evolution that you talked about and the future that you talked about. You mentioned that in '95 you had done an analysis of uh, users and the fact that they don't increase their overall... Uh, I didn't. The, um, I think it was NYU has done a, a set of studies over the years 
that they update every five years, and it's probably updated, which looks at this this metric of how people spend their their income on communications. And the surprising thing is that it has been, you know, within statistical variation, constant since 1900, this percent of household income. That's strange because, I mean, I, I recently came across figures uh, done for France where... U.S. Just, yeah, well, okay. the, Fr I mean, the French could be different animals altogether, but, I mean, with the arrival or the, diff the diffusion of the mobile phone. Uh, I should say, right. <coughs> their telecommunications budget had within the space of three years doubled, but which is surprising because you, you imagine that... You, you but in the U.S., yeah. and I don't have a, an accurate study of this, but I'll give you my impressions. Okay, people have traded, again. They've traded off cell phone, number of private lines has dropped. Right? So they're trading off, I'll, I'll get a cell phone, I'll give up my my line, I'll go over my, my second line, because it essentially still, I think most people look at what they spend for this broad communication, which also includes the newspapers, movies, a whole bunch of things in there. And that, you know, when they see that exceed this, whatever their threshold of pain is, they start saying, what can I trade? You know, no kid now in college use, has a phone in his dorm room that he pays for. You know, and it's, it's hurt universities tremendously because they used to make a lot of money out of, out of the long distance to call mommy and daddy. But now they, they sit with these things and they're cheap. And so there's a lot of trading going on. Yeah. I was going to ask, follow that up with, I mean, you also mentioned that um, with the existing bandwidth that we get into the home, it was difficult to foresee how that could be increased vastly. Uh, no, well, I didn't mean that if I said oh, okay. it. What, it's easy to see how to increase it vastly. It's hard to see what the economic justification is going to be for a company doing it. But that's the economic justification rather than um, the, to use the word that you don't like, a consumer. I mean, I, you know, when I watch my kids and how they have rapidly eaten up the, the bandwidth that they're given, I mean, take them 10 years into the future, they're, they're 10 and 12 now, I mean, I could imagine that from the consumer side they could eat up as much as they were given. I, don't, I actually don't think they can. Hmm. Uh, well, they, they can using uh, Darknet. That's a different <laughs> game. Uh, now, I'm not sure they can uh, in a uh, rational way. Kids don't, aren't necessarily <laughs> rational. But um, certainly you could eat up the bandwidth transferring movies down, even from a legal site, but chances are that the alternative is a much more viable thing. And if you're going to do that, uh, it's not clear that you need very high speed, that high a speed anyway. So it's if somebody walked into my house and said, Dear sir, um, I would like to give you a gigabit access, and I will charge you... Ninety dollars more a month, I, uh, more than my let's say, let's say seventy dollars more a month than I'm paying for my DSL line. I'd have to think about it. I'd probably do it, as I said, but I think the average person would say, "What's it by me?" But the, the speed right now is metered not by my communication speed. In most cases, it's the servers out there anyway. I mean, I, I think that I don't know what you. Obviously, what your kids use the internet for, but uh, certainly my sort of cousins and nephews now, um, the vast majority of it is plainly illegal file sharing. Um, the huge yeah. majority of it. Um, and there, I mean, there are figures released last week on the uh, mostly bulldog communication, I think, but the new uh, two megabit and four megabit lines that have only been announced for six months. Um, and they've had a very enthusiastic take up. Um, and I mean, and, and unless you're a sort of very heavy web and email user, the difference between a, a five, twelve kilobit line and a two megabit line for web and mail is pretty negligible. Yeah. Um, and the only thing you really notice the difference on is you know, music and movies. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the demand is coming from. It's hard to see anywhere else. And there's no really no, I can't see an upper limit on. There's no upper limit, but whether. <coughs> 
whether that's a viable long-term expectation for investing a couple billion dollars to provide the facility is probably an interesting question. Uh, I, I think there are applications that are real there, but I don't think we've developed even the beginning of an understanding of what they are. And all too often the watch myself a little bit here. All too often the work that has been done has been focused on scientific applications of high speed networks. And relatively little of that is transferable into the marketplace. Uh, and it's chicken and the egg. Would I invest in a company that had a brilliant idea right now before I get the facilities? be a hard call. Uh, would I build the facilities before I saw a company with the use for it? Mm, hard call. So what you're seeing in the U.S. now is a lot of uh, uh, peacock walking, I tend to call it. You know, they, they're saying we're going to put fiber into three towns in the country. But that's, you know, that's usually placating the politicians. Now you can say, look, we're, we're leading the country in that direction. Get off our back. It's just a hard act. Uh, I'd like to see it. Uh, so I commented the other day, another minor problem in the U.S. is that the official definition of broadband is 128 kilobits. And so all the numbers you see that say broadband is, you know, has grown this much is talking about something that can be essential, isn't quite satisfied by a 56 kilobit modem, but close. And that, that skews the numbers brutally. With the fiber to the home, would it stop being asynchronous? Would you have the same speed out as you have in? Oh, yes, you should. Uh, there's a nice nice company <coughs> actually in Milan, Italy, called uh, FastWeb. Look at that. It's a very interesting company. Does and that make a difference for consumers, you think? Like they can start finally hosting their own things? I think it could be. Uh, in Milan, they haven't found the particularly uh, overwhelming use of it for anything like that, to my knowledge. What does FastWeb do? FastWeb is a cute little system. It's, uh, it's a system put in by a company who banded together with the electric company and just for right-of-way issues. And they run fiber uh, down the poles, and then they, they, they tap off a plastic fiber in front of each residence and bring it in, bring in plastic fiber. You install plastic fiber with, with a wrench, you know, pair of pliers and a, a, cra as a typical carpenter installs that. Glass fiber, you get, you have precision instruments and you have a craftsman who periodically gets a fiber in his hand and goes on leave. So it's an automatic to difference in pain to install. And they supply, currently they're operating at 10 10 megs into the house, and they give you two HDTV channels, any two, you select the two, because they get the whole thing coming down the main fiber. The two telephone jacks, uh, and uh, something that varies between two megabits of data and more, depending on whether you're using your TV. You don't need much, turns out, bandwidth for digital HDTV. Uh, the system is capable of going at 100 megs. So if you move to Milan, you can get this. And they're selling it. The power. I was talking to the guy who, the broadband guy, at the meeting yesterday, and he said they're doing very well and they're beginning to come out of Milan. Uh, I, I first saw it years ago, and it struck me as just the right path to go. They're making a success of it, but Milan's a relatively small city. Skype is a viable business model, or they find a way to regulate that? They're regulated. What? Skype. The, the, I have it on this. Uh, well, there are two problems with Skype. What is it? Voice it's a voice over IP. Um, out of Estonia. And Michael yeah. Michael Powell gave a speech saying, look out, folks, here it comes. Well, Mike, Mike gives speeches, but on, on the other hand, his staff knows what. Um, there are two problems. First, um, a system which only works between devices, you know, is sort of, it's nice for calling India and, and all our students call home via Skype, no problem at all. It's, you know, uh, it's, the quality is actually better than some of the, the phone lines. But as a communication device, I also want to call you know, 
telephones. Okay? So the, you need the interface to that, which means you need a cost structure on that. But you they have it. It's a dollar a euro an, uh, an hour. It's they haven't marketed zero. with Avengers in the U.S. No, they haven't marketed it. But it, it actually yeah. works. It should. I mean, I mean the, the, <clears throat> the billing. No, wait, and, Dave, can't you just have a frob on here that connects into a phone line? And so that, that you that could build it. You out of the modem port. I, mean, maybe uh, I wouldn't do it that question. way. What, what I do is uh, usually they go to a server, yeah. and because you do have to do control, uh, there's a there's something called an SS7 that you have to be able to control because you are now a telephone system, right? So you're saying legally? I'm just asking. No, it's just practically. Okay. You're a telephone company, yeah. and you have to interface with the rest of the telephone industry in in a certain way, and you may have to pay connect charges depending on who you're dealing with there, and there are also a number of other problems that come with that. Now my question is... I think they'll evolve into a plain old telephone company with offering VoIP, VoIP services, which is what Verizon and others are doing. Um, I would hate to have that to be my only line, but if I had a cell phone, I'd be, I'd be happy in certain cases. Uh, it also, the quality is much better than some, but it's not up to necessarily my steam. I would love to see him succeed for very pedestrian reasons. Uh, a bunch of colleagues and I have a patent on that interface between VoIP and uh, <laughs> which, as far as we can tell, is, is a valid patent. My uh, question is, so I think they ought to go do it. Yeah. But I, they also have to con will conform have to conform someday. In fact, it may be remarkably early to uh, Korea. My question is whether, not not the legal issue, but but whether if VoIP, VoIP is working between two computers, someone can't just run a line into the into the phone system and pick it they up. They could, but then you'll have to have a computer at the end station where you're calling. Yeah, to. yeah. I mean, you're still between computer and computer. What I could do is relay somebody's call into the That's phone system yeah. for them. Uh, I don't think I'd like to do that. I'm, no, I'm just asking whether that was feasible. I think it's a lot legal. Yeah. I'm going to have to. Brian? Okay. Give me the short form. I'm still in a meeting. <laughs> okay, give me 10 minutes and that should work. Okay? Good. Sorry. I'm, I'm going after the, here to um, up to Newcastle and we're just uh, at some point trying to negotiate where Newcastle is. No, there are two of them. <laughs> Upon time. Up in Boston. But there's a lot more old castles than new castles. Ah, okay. No, this one's a good one. I know the place. I just trying to figure out the train schedule is hysterical. Good luck. Uh, anyway, sorry for that interruption. I, it's, Skype, I think, will, as most of them, will eventually have to face the legal requirements if they to operate in the U.S. Because they, they, in fact, the FCC ruling says they have to, and that's that's a problem. What they do in the rest of the world, there's a lot of problems with voice over IP in the rest of the world. If you look at the revenue of many countries, guess where it comes from? The landing charges for telephone. And they are, to put it mildly, upset. And you know, there's a lot of back pressure. Now, one, one absolute cure to this whole problem in the minds of a lot of people is we need internet governance, right? And who could do it better than an ITU, right? Mm -hmm. And who controls ITU altogether? The telephone industry. Mm -hmm. That would solve everybody's problem. We wouldn't have an internet left by the time they get there. That's a personal perspective. I, I went to the UN meeting. I'm still recovering from the behavior of some countries. That was bad. Very bad. I mean, I guess that kind of attaches to what you were just saying, but are we running, I mean, how does this regulation begin to work in a world that is, and the Internet is, functionally global? I mean, I came in a little bit late, Good but question. that's a really big problem. Well, how can an individual country state regulate uh, the Internet in any really Well, way? just for the record, okay, the telephone industry is inherently international, has been since from the beginning. In fact, it is a heavily regulated environment internationally, yeah. very heavily regulated. There, there are fees all over the place. There are 
There are treaty conventions that bind various phone companies to things. So you can't do it. The problem is unilateral laws, and that comes up in our, you know, can spam and all these nice things. The U.S., as I said the other day, has this incredible perspective that that there's nothing on the outside. So they pass laws that are completely <laughs> impossible to enforce other than with gunboats, and gunboats are getting a little obsolete. And besides, some of them are in places like Russia where they have funny things in silos still. So you don't want to attack them. You don't want to send armies in. Uh, send the FBI in, but they're not very effective in the, that world. Uh, it's it's a real problem. Normally, the way out of that is when you're in an international environment where where your domestic laws don't work. You you find a treaty organization and you come up with some arrangements. And uh, the thing that's scary to me is I know where some of those arrangements are apt to be, and I'm not going to like them. Now, remember the what was it called the new information order? Remember no. that? It was no. that before your time? <laughs> where UNESCO decided that, that in fact, um, to protect all the nice little uh, friendly dictators that they'd uh, arranged by treaty not to allow material into a country that the government of that country objected to, right? and a whole bunch of things which essentially said, well, we won't, you know, we'll be nice. We'll make sure that nobody gets upset by anything. Apply that in, to the Internet and you have something that nobody can use. When was that? Mid 80s. Mid 80s. And in fact, it came back again. The, some of the ITU discussions smelled remarkably like that, which is scary. The reaction of the White House, even this White House to that, was oh my God, here we come again. That's one of the reasons why there's somewhat less than enthusiastic collaboration on the U.S. part in some of these things. There's the past performance has not encouraged you to want to do that. But yet, uh, here you have this technology where, I mean, even nationally, anything you try to do, there'll be some clever trick around it. And so suppose, you know, we get the new info or the new IT order, and somebody has a way of getting through to a machine in Upper Volta. And then that roots all of this stuff, you see. Uh, and then by the time they realize it's up, upper Volta, it's now in yeah. wherever. Well, it's, it's always so, been very yeah. difficult to enforce international treaties. Uh, but I think here the case is it will be ludicrously impossible to enforce. Uh, I'm not sure that, I'm just not sure okay. that, uh, again, there's, I'm, I'm going to use this term very carefully. You're yeah, always sure. going to have outlaws. Yes, yeah, sure. I, I, that's not in a negative sense. Yeah. But the vast majority of people is what you're trying to. Mm -hmm. Commercial companies will not tend to use them. The, the main wealth will not tend to go that way. I get it. I get it. Uh, yeah. So you know, the pirate radios are not are not standard in the ways of communicating for most people. Sure. Sure. Although they're very useful. I noticed we just shut down some in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, which is surprising, actually. Yeah. Great. Thank well, you. let's all thank Dave.